Well, as uh, we mentioned at the start of our service today, uh, this is the first Sunday uh, in Advent. And uh, Advent is typically, you know, that time of year uh, when we revisit what it means to um, uh, what it means to speak of Jesus as God's Son, uh, to take a look at the Christ who is God come into the world, the the Word made flesh, God with us. It's also a time for us to acknowledge that there will come a time in history when Christ will come again, and so Advent has that double meaning. Uh, hearkening back to when Jesus first came as God in the flesh, but looking forward to when Christ will come again. You know, as Christians, um, we know the personality of the one who is overseeing history. And I think because of that, we tend to observe the drama of Christmas in ways that perhaps non-believers would not or do not, or at least we like to think we do. And, And that really, we kind of have a slight advantage, don't we, in knowing our place in time and in space, we have this sense of destiny uh, along with the Christ child. And so there's something more to life for us than what we read in the newspapers or see on TV. We know something bigger is going on. And Christmas is that really kind of supreme case in point. But let me ask you a question as we get started today. Has it not become a cliche among church people to talk about how secularized Christmas has become? I mean, I, I think for the last, all my 35 years of ministry, you know, every year somebody preaches a sermon on how secularized Christmas has become almost to the point where you know we've taken the Christ out of Christmas and all that's left you know is that Xmas you know how people write that Xmas it got me to thinking about a Christmas card that I received many many years ago and it was one of those kind of cards that was actually a, a, a couple of pages it was a short story in a Christmas card And the short story was about a royal couple, and it's really kind of a serious and sad story, about a royal couple who were holding a christening party for their infant son. And as all the guests arrived at the house for the ceremony, the servants, you know, would take their garments, their outer garments, and they would lay them on uh, the bed in the master bedroom. You know how we all do that when we have large gatherings to our homes. Well, when the time came for the actual christening, The baby couldn't be found. And so there was a frantic search that was taken and and the infant was discovered in the bed, buried under the coast and had suffocated uh, to death. Now, it's an interesting Christmas card to receive. (laughs) But the moral of the story in the card was that Jesus, the object of Christmas, has he been smothered under the weight of our secular seasonal trappings that was the the point of the card and as I thought about that story in my message today it really does strike me as kind of morbid I mean is it really as bad as that folks have we made Christmas a pagan party of hedonism Black Friday has come and gone Cyber Monday is tomorrow have we sold out to the secular And in doing so, suffocated the sacred. In other words, have we killed the newborn Jesus? And sometimes I got to tell you. Uh, Wait a minute. Wait uh, wait a minute, young man. Hold it here. Hold it. What? You're being a little hard on Christmas, aren't you? My goodness. I mean, you're laying it on pretty thick. I came here to worship this morning. And is Christmas really all that bad as you think it is? Has it really become that bad? Santa Claus. Is it really you? Good morning. Pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. I can't believe you're here. I don't remember ever seeing, ever seeing you in a worship service before. I don't know if I, my heart. You're making us a little bit, un, anybody feel uncomfortable here this morning with Santa Claus being here? My goodness. Wow. You make us a little uptight. I think any number of us here today are feeling uncomfortable. Well, Jeff, 
If you don't mind if I call you that, do you? No, that's all right. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. You're right. I often make Christmas uncomfortable. It's strange, and I really feel bad about that. A lot of folks think it's wrong to encourage me in any way. They think I'm even dangerous. They even think I'm anti-Christian. They think I've robbed Christmas of its real meaning. Well, you know, Santa, you've got to admit, you've made it a little bit awkward on yourself. You're sort of the secular rival of the Christ child. I mean, you hang out at shopping centers. You go to, you know, office parties. Your face is stamped on candy and cards. I mean, we see you as the spirit of consumerism and materialism and indulgence. I mean, isn't that basically what you stand for? Maybe, Jeff. Maybe in some people's eyes I do. But it certainly isn't what I started to be. My real name isn't even Santa Claus. That's a slang form of my real name, St. Nicholas. I don't even care for my name, Santa Claus. I prefer my, prefer my formal Christian title. Well, wait a minute, Santa. Are you saying that you're a Christian? That you, yourself, are a believer in Jesus? Exactly. Most people don't know it, but I was originally the bishop of the church in Myra in 4th century Asia Minor. That's near Turkey today. And I'm still recognized as a principal saint in the Eastern Orthodox faith. I was known for my kind and generous work among the poor, especially among children. I would travel about in my bishop's clothes, my long white beard, giving gifts to the needy, and encouraging other Christians to follow my example. Well, what happened? Because that's just not the way we see you today. Well, it's a long story. Suffice it to say, I've been victimized by many people throughout history, and my reputation has suffered. Over the centuries, people in different countries and different times have heard about my reputation as a gift giver, and they designed their own version of St. Nicholas until I ended up looking like this. In fact, what you see me today was first depicted in Clement Moore's poem, The Night Before Christmas, published in 1823. Around the world, I have different names, like Père Noel, Father Christmas, Bobo Natale, Yulinissen, just to name a few. But none of these are the real me. My essence remains committed to the Lord. I still wish people would see me and see him as the source of all love, peace, and generosity. Our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, he's the real Father Christmas. Oh, man, that's really incredible. And I, I got to tell you, I... I guess I've never known you that way <laughs> as a kid. I, got to, I liked you as a kid because of all the good stuff you gave me. But I've kind of felt guilty about liking you since I became a Christian. That's okay. It really is, Jeff. I'm used to it. What people don't know about me is that I do what I do because of what God, what God has given me. Hmm. I give because he gave first. I'll bet you didn't know that I go to church every Sunday during the rest of the year. In fact, I'm a Methodist. You're kidding! You're a Methodist? You really are? Sure I am, Jeff, if that's what you want to believe. <laughs> I may have to re-examine all my Christmas assumptions because maybe it's not as secular as we thought it was. Well, I think it's worth reconsidering. Rather than putting down everything worldly and separating the sacred from the secular, Maybe we should look for God's sacred signs in all places of society, even today's version of Christmas. Well, what might you mean exactly by that? Well, if you don't mind, may I stand behind the pulpit for a few moments? Uh, what do you folks think? Could, could he use the pulpit? Uh, all right, I guess we'd love to hear you some truth come right out of Santa Claus today. I've always wanted come on to be up a, here, Santa. I really have always wanted to be a preacher for Christ. <laughs> Hey, look, someone even left a Coke up here. <laughs> think they'd mind if I take a sip? I'm, I think they're happy you will. <laughs> so. Now there's a cliche. Yes. <laughs> you know, remember how you mentioned that business about Xmas yep. earlier? Yep. Did you know that the letter X for over 2,000 years has stood for the name of Christ? 
In Greek, it's the first letter in Jesus' name, the letter Chi. The X was an early sign exchanged between Christians during times of repression and persecution. It not only stands for Jesus, but it reminds us of, of the cross where he died. So you see, Xmas really isn't meant to be the sacrilege people think it is or say it is. That's fascinating to learn that. Are there other things about Christmas that maybe we've misinterpreted more sacred meanings that are still hidden in the secular? Well, as a matter of fact, there are. Take the Christmas tree, for instance. It's a beautiful Christmas tree you have here. Have you ever heard about that? Well, you know, a little bit. I remember one time hearing that it was maybe uh, tied to an old German tradition, maybe a pagan tradition or something like that. You're right. Well, you're part right anyway. That was an ancient origin, but you're missing the important story. How the tradition of the tree came to be a Christian tradition for us. Mm. In the 14th and 15th century, the designated miracle play for all churches on December 24th was the story of Adam and Eve. Mm. In those plays, an evergreen tree with an apple hanging from it was used to designate the lost innocence of Eden. And by the 17th century, they were known as Christ trees because Christ restored our fallenness mm. to the state of innocence in the eyes of God. People began bringing trees into their homes to remind them of Jesus' saving work. And they decorated them with fruit, candies, and cookies, and flat wafers to represent the Last Supper. I can't believe I have never heard this stuff before. I mean, my holiday is getting holier minute by the minute. Is there more you can tell us? Well, absolutely. What are the traditional colors of Christmas, Jeff? Well, just looking around this room, uh, I think probably red and green. That's right. And do you know why red and why green? I have no idea, but I have a feeling you're going to tell us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Christians adopted the green and red from the holly bush, which was popular among the Romans and the Britons because it stayed green during the winter months. It represented the hope of new life in the midst of the death of winter. For Christians, it has long represented the burning bush of Exodus, God's presence, fire in the midst of a bush that would not be consumed. Also, the berries and the thorns came to represent the blood and the prickles of Christ's crown. Later on in the 1820s, the poinsettia was shipped from Central America to the United States because it carried the same symbolic colors as the holly, and it also produced a bloom said to look like the star of Bethlehem, yet another sign of the Christ child. That's really very, very fascinating. You know, before we, our time runs out, I, I wanted to know if there's anything else a Christian in Christmas that maybe you think we've been missing. There are many, many, Jeff. Maybe you could mention a few things, a few of the trappings of the season, and I could give you some insight into their meanings. All right, that makes it a, a little bit easier. How about if you, could you tell us a little bit about, let's say, Christmas carols, kind of like the ones that we sang earlier. Oh, that's an easy one. That's really easy. Carols go back to St. Francis of Assisi. According to the tradition, St. Francis led the singing to praise God at the nativity scenes that he constructed in the town of Grisio, Italy. These songs and hymns spread throughout Europe along with the nativity scene, which itself became a sign of God's riches in the midst of our poverty. Or as St. Francis called it, God's holy poverty. Hmm. Very, very good. Here's one that I'm sure you've got a great answer for. What's up with all the Christmas stockings? Oh, that's an easy one. That's right up my alley. <laughs> and it will surprise you. Okay. They began with a story about yours truly, good old St. Nicholas. According to the legend, my heart was always in the right place with the poor. And one night I helped three daughters of an impoverished man by providing money for their dowries in, a gold, in gold bags so they could marry and relieve their father's burden. I threw the money down the chimney, and some fell into some of the stockings hung near the fireplace to dry. Hmm. The rest is history. The point is, the stocking was originally a symbol of liberation from the oppression and poverty. What more Christian a message could there be than that? Absolutely right about that. That's definitely, this is a whole new way for us to look at things. And, and you know, you bring out another good point. The Christ of Christmas is still all around us. No matter how much we try to ignore him or reshape him or 
commercialize him, Jesus is still there. My sentiments exactly. And what I'd like to tell all the young people out there, and all of you that are not so young but wish you were, uh, maybe it's to keep your eyes and hopes on Jesus. I don't care whether or not you believe in me. That's unimportant. What is important is whether or not you believe in the baby, in the manger, and the God that sent him to us and invites him and invites us to place him at the center of our lives. I am so glad that, that that's exactly the way you feel because that's how we feel. In fact, yesterday as we were decorating the sanctuary, um, up here on our altar we have a manger scene and we couldn't find the Christ figurine. And so we've been searching for a Christ figurine that we could place there as a symbol of Jesus being at the very center of our lives and at the very center of our worship. So I'm glad to hear that that's exactly what you want too. You know, Jeff, that's fantastic. I always carry a symbol of Jesus close to my heart and I happen to have brought a figurine with me today. May I place it at the center of oh, your nativity scene? Please, please do. That would be wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you. It's wonderful. In fact, Jeff, in fact, it's really an honor to place the Christ child there today. I appreciate you letting me do that because I'm only a holiday character. But Jesus, Jesus is the Holy Savior. I make a list, I check it twice <laughs> to find out who's naughty or nice. But Jesus watches our hearts. And wants to eliminate the sin in all of us. We all need him. And his gift is something so great, it doesn't fit under a Christmas tree or in a stocking. Only a cross could hold it. And it isn't given only at Christmas. Jesus works 365 days, 24-7 a year, and gives us his gift every moment of every day. The happiness old Santa provides is temporary, but Jesus provides us permanent joy. That's something we all need to take to heart this Christmas. Oh, thanks so much for that great message, Santa. You know, you preach a pretty mean sermon after all. <laughs> well, thanks for being here today. I want you to know we're going to promise to spread as much generosity each and every day throughout the new year as we are able to do so. Merry Christmas, Santa. Thank you so much for coming. There, it's really been my pleasure. Thank all of you for having me today. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, Merry everybody! Christmas. Merry Christmas! Ho, 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 ho! Wow, can you believe St. Nicholas with us today? But wasn't he right? Jesus walked as a sacred figure through the secular streets of the world. But in the process, he saved us sinners. And he even saved St. Nicholas. So let's dedicate ourselves this year and this Advent season to Christ's ways as we seek to claim, uh, claim him for the new year, all to the glory and honor of God our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Thank you so much, uh, gracious and loving God, for the gift of your Son and for the privilege of worshiping him and placing him at the center of our lives. And for the many uh, interesting characters, both real and, and not, who remind us uh, to remember Jesus, to stay with Jesus, to follow the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you that you are the Lord of righteousness. And it is to you that we turn our attention in this Advent season. Amen.